I just wanted to ask how you guys went about getting funding for Block because I'm trying to, uh, I guess, start up my own my own creative collective right now, and that's like one of the hardest parts I'm finding is just getting the funding and the money to get everything started up. So how did you guys go about doing that? Sure. How about now? How about now? There it is. Okay. Um, so I'm going to answer your question in a long, like, good way. Blabbing was bootstrapped. I used my personal money for a very long time. We just received funding in, like, February. Oh, wow. So um, I, I think that I, I, I don't think that everybody needs to raise venture funding. We raised venture funding because our servers were breaking and we were getting hacked. And it was too expensive to not have engineers on staff. And engineers cost a lot of money and you can't justify an expense of an engineer because they take a long time to make back the money that you're investing in them, right? Because their salaries are $80,000 plus versus a sales associate, I'm just gonna do some math so you guys can hear what I'm talking about. So versus a sales associate might be paid $40,000, but their sales quota might be for $100,000, right? So they're making their salary back for the company, and engineer doesn't do that. So that's why a lot of tech companies need to raise funding because their projects are just a little bit longer lead time. Um, so to talk about how I did go about raising money, I'll tell you about a few mistakes I made. So I started to raise money, uh, let's see, last spring. And I started in a very traditional way that a lot of black tech companies start, which is by going to black VCs. Because so I was like, they get me, they speak my language, they know my glabbies are a pop, right? Mm -mm, that was a bad idea. That was a bad idea because a few reasons. One, they're coming a lot, they're carrying a lot of the same weight that I am. They're a black VC, but they don't necessarily work at a black venture fund, right? So they can't only invest in black companies, so their standards are actually going to be really, really high. And, um, and so they can't really, they can't fail because they've also a puzzle to get to where they are. So I spun my wheels a lot. At the same time, they were super helpful. They wanted to give me advice. And so I had a lot of false positives. Because so I was like, oh, well, they're responding to my emails really quickly. We have, you know, we're on the phone. They're answering my questions. So they feel invested and then they, that will translate to a check. Wrong. No. Exactly. No, it doesn't. So um, I was not, that was a mistake. And I wasted, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I move quickly. Right? So in my world, I was like six weeks on that, which is a long time. Um, so then I was like, I'm not ready. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not ready. The company's not ready. They're asking questions I wasn't really sure I could answer in a way that, that inspired confidence. And so I stopped. Totally stopped fundraising. Built more and more over the summer. Blavity grew more. Made a little bit of money. Got to the point where I really was like, I literally cannot grow the business unless I have a check. Okay. So at that point, um, a friend of mine, Jason Towns, was like, hey, Morgan, um, you should apply for some accelerators. And I was like, no, accelerators are so time consuming. I'm busy. And he was like, no, really, you should apply for an accelerator. So there was an accelerator called New Media Ventures, and it was non-traditional. And um, they were people who aligned with me, and they aligned with our mission, and they aligned with our values. And they weren't main brands. Um, they only invested in a few startups that you probably have heard of, um, but they trusted me and they understood me and they understood why what I was doing was important. So I got my first check from the Media Ventures at fifty thousand dollars last fall, and then through that I was able to use that small money to build a little bit more. So I built for about a month and a half, and then I started raising my pre-seed round, um, and from there through their connections and really using their faith in me as the proof point to the rest of the market to say, look, Blavity is successful, we're gonna be successful, we're gonna make a lot of money, we're gonna have a lot of users get on board now. Um, and it still was not very easy. I mean, you know, people had to pick me up off the floor during the process, it was not easy. But it's done. Um, and I think going through that process, it's really a mental game. I think a lot of entrepreneurship is about your mentality and about um, staying positive, staying focused, and not letting other people 
tell you where you should be going because there is no pathway. Like, there's not going to be another Facebook. There's not going to be another Snapchat, right? There's not going to be another Blavity. There's not going to be another Essence. It, it's not supposed to be that way, right? Like, it's, you're not supposed to be duplicating other people's businesses, um, which is one of the things, I think, that goes against venture funding in a lot of ways because they're pattern matching. And so, yeah, that was really long-winded. But <laughs> there you go. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm in the process of trying to plan my like cubicle divorce. So I feel like Shout out to the cubicle divorce. The struggle is real. Um, but I feel like I am really good as far as my content and what I am able to specialize in, but I'm not always confident in what I know as far as entrepreneurship. So looking back over your journey, what do you feel like you wish you would have understood or did more due diligence around before you went into the project of entrepreneurship for yourself? Uh, that's a great question. And I think there's a lot of questions that a lot of, like, I call them entrepreneurs. Like, you want to be an entrepreneur, but you're not quite ready yet because um, it's scary and you're going to be broke and it's going to be stressful. And I think that, um, especially as people of color, like, there's a lot of risk involved. And I think that people overthink it. They spend a lot of time researching, they spend a lot of time writing and drafting emails, they spend a lot of time um, you know, reading books and making budgets, and that's all time and energy they could have been spending building their business and building their, their goals. Um, and so, you know, I'd ask you to really think about how you're spending your time and your energy and think about, okay, well, can I start now before I leave my nine to five? What can I do now so that it's less scary? Whether that's saving, you know, you need your cushion, you need your financial cushion, um, or whether that's building your audience like we did before we left uh, our full-time jobs. There's lots of different ways. It just depends on what the biggest risk is for you personally. Um, what, what's your worry bubble? And then address that head on now so that it can be reduced. Hi, Morgan. I'm Liz. Um, question. You talked about how the death of Mike Brown uh, impacted you so much that you had a cubicle divorce, right? Um, but how do you stay socially conscious, you know? Uh, something that powerful, that of that magnitude drove you to start your business. But like a lot of businesses, once you start growing, um, the followers and your business, how do you stay true to something that communities like Ferguson, like Roxbury that we're in now, uh, are facing? That's a good question and it's something that um, the team and I think about frequently because as we grow and as the pressure to monetize becomes greater, you can be pushed further away from where you started it in the first place. Um, and I think for me personally, it's, be, it's the people that I have around me. You know, I hire and work with people who this is fundamental to who they are. And they work tirelessly because they believe in the mission. And so, you know, Blavity, we could make a lot more money and have a lot more users if we were covering Kim Kardashian every day. We just could. Um, and we don't. We have like a no Kim K rule on the team. This is like the only crowd that would clap for that. It's true, right? And like, I'm like, if we're gonna cover any of the Kardashians, it like needs to be like from a point of view of us challenging society, and it needs to be about something interesting. It needs to be about something that's gonna be meaningful and push culture forward. And so, when we onboard new team members, and when we think about our ideas and our projects, it's critical that we think about what's the impact, right? Um, what is the impact on culture? What is the impact on our community? Um, and you know, I, I guess I, I kind of, it's like easy to say not because we're still really early. Like I'm not that far removed from starting. It was like yesterday to me, you know? Like I just moved out of my apartment. You know what I mean? Like it was two seconds ago. So I think in the future though, I can see how um, with working with big brands, like working with a Cadillac or working with um, a Target, how there's gonna be times where our morals are gonna be compromised. 
right? So for example, McDonald's, right? McDonald's is the biggest advertiser and spender in the black community and multicultural, right? So as a black business, you're like, do I want this money, right? Because they're the biggest spender. Do you go after the biggest budgets? No, you just don't, right? Like we've, we, and we've had arguments about this. Me and um, our CEO, Aaron, we go back and forth. Like, do we accept their proposal? Well, what if they did a web series on like black vegan cooking? Like, maybe that would be okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> seriously though, right? And so these are negotiations that we have with ourselves on a daily basis. And we're not always gonna get it right. I mean, Blavity is not always gonna get it right. Um, but it is critical to our mission. And so it's something that I'm committed to. Hey, um, I have a question about your content creators and um, that part of your team. So I remember really back in the day when Blavity was starting and you just constantly see these things saying, hey, do you want to write for a black lifestyle blog? Holler at us. Um, and now I imagine you can be so much more picky because you have uh, amazing popularity. But how did you first go through your content creators and see who you wanted to bring on and who you kind of passed on and what does the process look like now as far as making sure all of them are really staying on message? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So um, you're right. When we first started, we were like, we had a really low barrier to entry because there wasn't that much competition, right? Um, and actually, we had, so we had our contributor base and then, um, quickly realized that we were limiting ourselves because there were so many voices, there were just so many people who had something to say. And so we opened up the platform and now anyone can submit. So about 75% of our content is community generated. It's not actually written by our staff and our editors anymore. And, and that's beautiful, right? Like, that's amazing. Particularly because there are people who don't want to write, like, every week or every day. They just want to be like, yo, Lemonade was dope. And, like, here's why. You know what I mean? Or, like, there's hashtags. There's a hashtag that was trending today about black salons, right? And someone was like, oh, this hashtag is trending. I want to curate it, right? And, like, great, right? Um, so if you... The, the real thing is, for me, is how do I make that scalable? Because right now, it's a Google form, I mean, we're super scrappy with it. It was a Google form, I was like, hey, what would happen if we created a Google form and like let people submit their own content? Well, now we have like 50 submissions a day, right? So then we had to hire editors to really curate that content, make sure that it stayed on voice and on tone, which is your second part of your question, is like how do, when you go on Blabity, you don't necessarily know that it's all user generated, right? You're like, oh, this is the same site that I read yesterday or last um, and that's because we have amazing editors who are very good at giving feedback um, and managing headlines and making sure that things are uniform across the site. You know, so for example, one of our signatures is that we'll write just like a normal news story and then we'll like end with a GIF reaction, a GIF reaction to who you are, right? So it'll be like, what? Um, and so we'll add those elements so that we have that uniformity. So right now we're on WordPress, that's our tech stack, um, but our engineers are working on the new version of the site. So the new version of the site, which you guys will see in a few months, probably just depending, probably like four weeks from now, maybe six weeks, um, will be way more, uh, it'll be very easy to submit content on the site. Right? So it'll be easy to say, I have something to say, I can submit it. You'll get notifications when it's been accepted, when it goes up, um, and that will help make sure that Blavity continues to be open and not just, oh, this is like Morgan's site and like this is what Morgan thinks, so I'm only gonna accept those perspectives. Um, the risk that we run is that because Blavity has a really strong brand, people, especially if we have a uh, opinions that don't match up, right? So if we have opinions that are different, which are welcome on the site, people are like, but you just wrote an article last week that said that. And I'm like, well, no, right? Because Blavity is not just one voice, it's a variety of voices, it's a diversity of voices, and it's all about letting people have a platform to share their perspective and show content and share ideas. So um, we're hoping in the future with our new design, people will understand that a little bit more instead of viewing it as like, Blavity's editorial staff has this to say. But you'll know when we do have something to say, because we'll be like, Blavity staff, right? And then you can rip me apart on Twitter. <laughs> oh yeah, sure. 
My name's Leticia. Um, I'm actually trying to be a television writer, so I'm trying to get to where you are in LA, definitely at Boston. And you talked earlier about trying to make moves while you're at your nine to five, and like one of the things you mentioned is like squirreling away your nuts for the right time to leave. And like I think I'm stuck in that spot where like it's just so easy to keep pushing up, like oh, like my goal is to save X amount of money so I can feel more comfortable. Yeah. So how do you push yourself outside of that? Um, Fears, so, I guess. Uh, can I ask you one question, please? Do you um, do other people know what your goals are? Yes. Are they holding you accountable to them? They'll check in, like, so how's that going? But no one's gonna be like, hey, what's up? Are you doing that thing that you mentioned to me yesterday? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> That's what you need. So in in San Francisco, I surrounded myself with CEOs and um, people in, in early stage tech startups that would literally be like, you can't talk about gravity until you quit. Like, you can't sit there at this happy hour and be like, Morgan, CEO of gravity. And so, a full time job with this. So, they held me accountable. And like, I remember Deshaun, um, who's the CEO of Maven Hair, which is, if you don't know, um, a hair startup for weed. And to give stylists, if that going to use my store, the stylist is not direct. Um, and Deshaun was like, I literally, I think I'd seen him maybe like three times, and every single time he was like, Have you quit? Have you quit? It was like really embarrassing. He'd be like, No, no, I haven't. No. Um, so I think surround yourself with people who are like minded, people who are already doing what you want to do, because then they're going to hold you accountable. Whereas your friends, like your sister girls, and whatever, they're going to just be like, oh, yeah, OK, girl, OK, cool. So sometimes you need someone who's already doing or, you know, what you want to do and where you want to be. I, I, I think we won right now. Yeah. Where is she? Oh, we're going back here. Oh, oh. Hi. Hi. Hi, Aisha. <laughs> uh, I'm couple questions. One, are you looking at all of the different social media apps that are coming out and constantly trying to do the latest thing? Or are you like, um, or Blavity in general, sticking with some of like the t tried and true social media apps? That's the first question. And the second question is, more in general, um, where did you get the skills to lead and start your own thing, you know, the time, like keeping time, money, like terms, all that stuff. Before you did uh, 500 startups, where, did you, where do you think you got those skills? I'm going to answer that one first. Um, I didn't have the skills. I don't know. I didn't know anything about, you know, accounting. Um, so, you know, I think that you have to learn what you don't know very quickly. And then you have to address and be honest with yourself about what you don't know and find someone who does know how to do it. So um, one example is SEO. I, for some reason, am still very stubborn about SEO. Like I never hired an SEO consultant. So SEO is search engine optimization, right? So it's like organic search in Google. When you type in Drake, who, who comes up first? Is it Drake's Wikipedia? Is it Rap Genius Drake? Is it an article from Complex with Drake in it, right? And that's responsible for a lot of traffic on the internet is having really good results in the search engine. Blavity search engine is like really, the optimization is really bad. Like I just haven't focused on it and the team hasn't focused on it. And I was at um, the fader the other day, like on Monday or Tuesday, and um, I was looking at their Google Analytics with one of their team members and I was looking at their um, SEO and I was like, damn! Like, you guys have so much organic traffic, like, how do you do it? And he was like, do you do any SEO optimization? And I was like, mm, no. <laughs> like, you know, and, and I didn't even know. Like, I didn't know what the missed opportunity was, right? And at that point, and, and that should happen for all of you guys all the time. Like, you should be asking so many questions. Of, like, okay, how? Like, what's the tool that you use? Who are the people that you've talked to, right? And then you have a choice. Once you learn that you don't know how to do something and you learn that that was a missed opportunity, you can decide to ignore it, right? I can just go about my busy day, not hire an SEO consultant, not implement any of the tools that they were talking to me about, or, because I'm busy and I've got things to do, right? Or 
I can adjust and say, I don't know that. You just told me something that could be low-hanging fruit. Let me go learn or let me go hire someone to teach me or do it for me. And so, you know, that was what? Monday, Tuesday, it's Thursday. I still haven't done anything. But my plan is to think about it more and to think about what our course of action should be. And I think, um, you know, an entrepreneur is never going to know everything. It's just literally like part of the game. Um, and so it's about how quickly can you identify your weaknesses and adjust. So your second question, or your first question, what was your first question? Ah, yes. Am I like on all the apps? Um, so yes and no. We, limited resources, you just can't be. Like, I, I, it, it wouldn't have made sense for us to build a critical, try to build a critical mass on every platform. So I think when you guys are thinking about your new projects and your ideas and your companies, pick one platform that's gonna be your foundation. And for us, that was Twitter. And then pick a secondary platform. And that was Instagram for us. And you could argue that that was a mistake or that if you had chosen Facebook, maybe we would have grown a little bit faster because most social traffic to a website is like from Facebook. Um, but it was important that we picked something and that we focused on something because all content doesn't make sense on every site or every platform. So on our Instagram, people who follow us on Instagram, they can get their own creative experience and never have to go to the website. For a long time, our Instagram followers didn't even know that Blavity existed outside of Instagram. And I'm sure there's people now who are like, oh, you have a website? And I'm like, that's like 99.9% .9 of what I do. But, you know, that's cool because it's an experience that was good enough for them and it, it accomplished a goal for them. And so when you're thinking about new platforms, don't overstretch yourself because you should be designing the experience in the platform unique to that platform. A Snapchat platform and content strategy is going to be different than a YouTube strategy, right? It's both video, but it's not the same use case. Um, so Blavity is, I'll tell you the ones we, we don't care about. We don't care about Tumblr, we don't care about Pinterest, we don't care about Periscope, um, we don't care about, kind of sort of care about Facebook Live, we just tested it, not really sure if I agree with it. We haven't done Facebook Instant Articles, we are going to do Google's AMP, which is similar to Facebook Instant Articles. Um, so yeah, I mean we're we're intentional about what we don't what we don't do just as much as we are about what we do do. Go ahead. Um, so I noticed that with well, Blavity you've actually moved or your your site has gotten bigger and bigger, and it seems like a lot of the content and just the information and the energy around it is not really centered on the site itself. Mm -hmm. Is that something long term that you're considering? Where you know. Sites like um, BuzzFeed, most of that stuff is actually off, most of the energy around them is off the site. Is that long term where you think you'll be going? Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, media and content distribution will become platform agnostic because um, we just don't live our lives that way, right? Like, you know, Netflix has done an amazing job of not being platform agnostic, right? You can't get. House of Cards anywhere else. So you're paying that eight ninety nine or nine ninety nine every month, and your mom is <laughs> to get it all the time. <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, I mean, I think anyone that can build a, a, a website or a brand, um, you know, they should be thinking. They should be thinking about how do they expand that outside of one. So for Blavity specifically, we're thinking about more so what does Blavity stand for? So when someone sees the Blavity logo and they see the Blavity like brand, what do they associate with that? And that's why with our social platforms, we do have different voices. Our Twitter voice is very like ratchet, news at night, we'll like post gifs, we'll be like twerk, like whatever, right? On Instagram, it's like very entrepreneurial, like very woke, and like very artsy, right? Our Snapchat is like a television network. We have people do takeovers. So we'll have creators take over our Snapchat and be like, oh, I was at the Diddy concert, or it'll be an artist, or it'll be at a video shoot, it'll be, um, you know, taking someone around Paris, right? And so what that enables us to do is to build a brand that will last when Snapchat goes down, right? Or will last when Facebook stops being the main distribution channel for content. 
um, and it will, in fact, grow our business. Say, for example, you guys found out that Blavity had a television show going on on Netflix, you'd be like, hmm, like, that's interesting. I know what Blavity stands for. I know what Netflix stands for. That could be really cool, right? We don't have a television show coming out on Netflix. <laughs> yes. Yet. Um, but I just want to give you guys you know, a sense of the possibilities and why it's important to build the brand, to build the mission, and build the community, and be explicit about what it stands for, because then you have the flexibility to move in different spaces and to be resilient in a world that moves exponentially in technology. Um, one, I'm just so excited you guys are here. Like, this is the first step, I think, for a lot of you. Hopefully, you guys are already in it. Like, hopefully, you're already thinking about a lot of the things that we talked about tonight. Um, you know, I think starting off on this journey as a creator and an entrepreneur, it's scary, you know? But you're surrounded by people who are about to go on this mission with you and about to go on this journey, and so connect with each other. And, like, be vulnerable, be open, follow up. Like, don't be like, oh, yeah, I'm gonna follow up with you. No, like, actually follow up with them. Go out for coffee, schedule a video hangout. Um, I think that's so important, and that's the only reason why I'm here today is because I had friends, and I had entrepreneurs, and I had creators who are pushing me along the way and ultimately helped me build Blavity and are part of my success and part of my success story. So this is your best like network, um, and use it. So thank you for having me, and thank you for...